welcome back. You know, a couple months ago, we had a guest that was so outrageous, so good, had me so mesmerized, I said, you are coming back. And guess what? He did. We had a guest who talked about the greatest beer run ever. This guy delivered beer to his friends in Vietnam during the war. My name is Vin DeQuino. Our guest, the amazing Chick Donahue. Hey. Chick, man, you had me mesmerized. But you were so good, I wasn't paying attention, and we didn't get to finish the story. I got to hear it a little bit later, and I said, Chick, you're coming back. And here you are. So this greatest beer run ever. We have to remind the audience what exactly this was all about. So tell me again, what was the greatest beer run ever? The greatest beer run ever was <laughs> Chickie's Odyssey. <laughs> During the war in Vietnam, the year was 1967, one of the uh, kids who were killed from the neighborhood, and there were 26 killed from the inward section of Manhattan. The wow. last one that I remember wow. was Tommy Minogue. And, uh, we were discussing in the uh, the local bar. You didn't go to Doc local Fitness. bars, did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah I wound up buying it, as a matter of fact. Well, did you? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. had so much fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we uh, we decided that there were all these demonstrations and the uh, the guys over there who were literally dying, wound, whatever, uh, somebody had to go over there and let them know that we still supported them, we loved them, give them a pat on the back, yep. and since we were in a bar, buy them a beer. Of course. So uh, obviously nobody was qualified to go. I was a merchant seaman at the time. I had been discharged from the Marine Corps, and at, at that time I was a merchant seaman. I had seaman's papers, so I oh. could go, yeah. get a ship, Wow. and get there at least. Yeah, uh, so you had all the proper papers. I had, well, I had seaman's papers. Oh. That was all I needed it's, to get yeah. on a ship, and wow. the ship would take you there. Wow. At least the ship that carried ammunition. They weren't taking ammunition to Bermuda. Oh, whoa. So uh, I went down to the, you know, Colonel Lynch, the local bartender. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he organized this as far as getting their addresses and everything. And the next day I come back and he had Tommy Collins' mother there, a nice Irish woman with the brogue. <laughs> Go see in my Tommy. Oh, tried to give me a hundred bucks. I'll never forget. I, I could have used the hundred, but I couldn't take it. Because if Tommy was on the other side of a, of a, a alligator-infested river, or on the other side of a, 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 a minefield, yeah, might not have been able to. I would have had to cross it. Chicky, you. I gave it back. My to guess Harvard. is you would have anyway. <laughs> well, I, anyway, I, yeah. I, I said I'll take care of it, Mrs. Collins, not to worry. And then I went to see uh, Ricky Dugan, another one of the guys. Uh, I saw his mother and told his mother what I was planning on doing. Uh, she was very nice to me and all, but she was probably giggling. And uh, <laughs> then I went to see Bob Pappas's father, Spiro. And I told uh, Mr. Pappas, Spiro, uh, what I planned on doing. He, oh, that's very nice of you, Chicky. No, no. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, and that was fair. So I went, and uh, by hook and by crook, uh, I got off the ship in Quinon. I took a Detroit Quick Three from Leonardo, New Jersey. Took me to Vietnam. I got off, and the first kid I found was Tommy Collins. Actually, before wow. I put a foot on land, he was on one of the other ships in the harbor as an MP. That and kid must have freaked out. <laughs> we freaked out, and, uh, yeah. and then we went out. And, and had a uh, beer. And we had a beer. <laughs> and we sang some Irish songs like we were used to doing in the yeah. old neighborhood. Yeah, sure. And uh, during uh, that night out, I uh, met a Texan who had a big 1st uh, Cavalry patch on his... Uh, with a cowboy hat and all, well, and yeah. obviously a pilot or a crew member. And, uh, I, and Ricky Dugan was in the first cab, at least. I, wow. I, so I asked oh, him, I said, you know Ricky Dugan? No, I don't know Ricky Dugan. I said, he's in Charlie Company or something, the first cab. He says, oh, yeah, they're up in Ankei. I said, well, I'm his stepbrother. I gave him the story, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and I promised Mom I'd get to see him over <laughs> here. And so the guy says, well, if you want, I'll take you up there in the morning. I'm going up in the morning. I said, how are you going to get me there? You know, I knew it was up in the mountains. He said, well, I got my own plane. He says, I'm the crew chief, you know. And, uh, you be on the tarmac at 0800, and I'll take you there. So uh, Collins made sure I was on the tarmac at 0800 the next morning. And he Basically, at this time, you're a civilian. 
I am a civilian. Yep. I'm a, I'm a civilian. I'm a <laughs> merchant marine civilian and off the ship. Uh, and uh, I went to On K, and then I got a ride from On K. In On K, I ran into Kevin McClune, another guy on the list, who uh, grew up in Long Beach but hung out in Inwood, the old neighborhood. And uh, he was in the Marines, and he was a, a, a radio operator or a fix-it guy on a, on a helicopter. Yeah. Geez. So I ran it to uh, Kevin. We had a beer. And then uh, I got a ride up to uh, Fubai up north, and, uh, and then a, a, a truck ride uh, to uh, an LZ uh, tombstone outside of Fubai. And then on a helicopter, I talked my way <laughs> onto a helicopter. Same thing, and my stepbrother and mom died or whatever. <laughs> I gave him the sob story, and they flew me up to uh, this LZ Jane, where the first cab had just arrived, and uh, and Ricky Dugan was out in what they call an uh, 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 ambush perimeter, outside the main thing, oh and they God. called him in, and they didn't know what to do with me. They couldn't even <laughs> recognize that I was there, because certainly I didn't belong there. So they told Dugan, you just take him. He's yours. <laughs> Get him away from Get him us. out of here. Get him out of here. <laughs> so Dugan had no place to take me but back out to this uh, ambush uh, perimeter. Oh, my God. And I spent, uh, as he would describe it, a scary night out there. And uh, there was some banging, then banging, and rockets and shooting and all of this and everything. And uh, the next morning, uh, we came back in. And uh, I spent another day there, and the next day uh, he got me. And, and all the time, I wasn't supposed to be there, obviously. And about I, how old are you at this time? 26. 26 I was 26 years old. Years old. Most so you look like one of the boys? I look like an officer or something. Yeah. You know, now, they, how were you dressed? Did, did you have Dungarees, a uh, what they described as like a mattress shirt. Clothes. Oh, I had long red hair, reddish brown <laughs> hair, and a half a beard, and a mustache. And I certainly did not look like a military guy. But I knew all the lingo from just coming out of the Marines a couple of years before. So I talked a good game. Yeah, and and they uh, they just the guys you were still coming talk over. a good game, chick. Well, <laughs> Mama told me years ago, use what talents the Lord gave you. There you go. So that's what I that's what I practice. So <clears throat> I saw Dugan, spent the night at two with Dugan, and then the next uh, he got me a ride on a on a helicopter to <laughs> Quang Tri Airfield near the DMZ, and I got a ride on a plane down to Phu Cat, and then I was walking down the road to Quinon where I left my ship. And, uh, and I was out there, it's now nighttime, the third night, and <coughs> I found out later I should not have been out on that road. So I don't think you should have been on, a, on a, any yeah, part of it. Yeah, well, <laughs> probably right. I, yeah. But I came back what? to Phuket, spent yeah. the night Here there. Are. Next day they put me in a, in a convoy. I got to ride on a convoy. Wow. As simple as asking a, a GI driving a truck, hey, you mind if I ride down to Quinon with you? Sure, come on. You know, you had someone to talk to. <laughs> Why know? not? Yeah. So I got in, I rode to Quinon. I went to the waterfront. I went to where I would have found my ship, and the ship was gone. Oh, jeez. So I got in contact with Collins, and uh, we went to this sh uh, the harbor master, and he told me I, n I needed to go to BOQ, and they'd get me orders to go down to Saigon to get me some, because I had no passport, I had yeah, no visa, oh all I had was this ID card from the Coast Guard, which identified me as a merchant seaman. So <clears throat> I told the guy, I said, well, why don't I just go down to Saigon and get it instead of waiting a couple of days, as he indicated, for the, for the orders. And he says, i never forget what he said to me. He said, like, I look stupid. He said, you can't go anywhere in Vietnam without orders. I just flown <laughs> back and forth, north, south, east, west. It just got back. I said, so let me try. So I went out to the airport. Colin yeah. took me out to the airport again, or one of his guys, and and I hitched a ride down to Saigon, and I went right to the embassy, and uh, and I identified myself. Okay, they have you reported as missing. Boop 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 beep beep beep. Oh, so I said, oh, you you got a passport? No. Oh God, we got to get your passport. So it took a few days. They issued me a passport. And in the meantime, they gave me like an allowance to live on. Oh my God! It was God. in the union contract, the National Maritime Union, and it, but the, it was like twenty dollars a day, twenty-five dollars a day—a yeah. lot of money in Saigon. But still, I couldn't stay in the Hilton. Yeah. So I, I spoke Japanese. I'd learned in the Marines. And I don't know if you wanted to stay in the Saigon Hilton. No, no, no. <laughs> that would be the, the Hanoi Hilton. Though yeah, I thought I was going there once. <laughs> but <clears throat> I, uh, I, I lived in Shalong. Uh, a Chinese section of Saigon, an old Korean hotel, and the old Koreans still spoke wow. Japanese there. 
So I lived there, and it took about a week or so, and, uh, and they called me. I got my passport, and I got the passport, and then I had to go get a visa, so I went to the a Vietnamese equivalent State Department. They issued me a visa after I paid him a $900 bribe wow. that the consul had given me to bribe him. Wow. That's how wide open bribery and oh corruption God. was there. Anyway, and then uh, he says, all right, listen, uh, we're going to get you a ship and get you back to the States. Oh, great. So it took him two days, three days later, whatever it was. And uh, he said, all right, and I had to report in every day. So uh, you come here tomorrow morning. We got a flight leaving Thompson at Airfield about 9 o'clock, 9.30, whatever the time was. And we'll fly you to Manila, and there's a ship there ready to, willing to take you on as a crew member. Great. So <clears throat> it was New Year's, Chinese New Year's, Chinese New Year's Chinese. Eve. Wow. So I went out and celebrated with a friend of mine who I'd run into there from beer. past night, had a few <laughs> beers. And I woke up in the morning in Chalon, and uh, somebody blown my windows out in this little hotel. I was the only Westerner in the hotel. And, uh, and I thought, geez, they really celebrate New Year's here. You know, you know, I know they had a lot of fireworks, and, and I did well, not realize. Fireworks are pretty close to the ground here. <laughs> well, what I had heard all night, I thought was fireworks. It wasn't really fireworks, and that was the beginning of the Tet Offensive, which I was not aware of wow. until I got downtown like at 6 o'clock in the morning, 5.36. And uh, I went to the Majestic Hotel along the river, and <clears throat> I realized then the place was under siege. I couldn't accept it. I wouldn't let it into my stupid brain. That, you know, what do you mean? Oh, no, they, they, they're attacking Tonsonet. They have Tonsonet. They, they took uh, the Brinks, the BOQ in downtown Saigon. They occupied the embassy. Uh, I said, they can't occupy the embassy. I have to go there and get a, a ride out to Tonsonut to get to Manila. You ain't getting no ride. They got Tonsonut and they got the embassy. But then I realized I really had no place to go. Yeah. They took Chalon, so I couldn't go back to the old neighborhood. And, uh, I, and nobody wanted me. They wouldn't let me uh, hang out in the lobby of the Majestic. Wow. By the way, I went back there two months ago and spent uh, a couple of nights oh, in the Majestic. There, right? Must have yeah. been wild. Well, it was a big difference now. Yeah, you but anyway, tell us about that later. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, <clears throat> I worked my way up to, uh, to the embassy, and when I got to the embassy, I still couldn't accept in this brain that they had taken the U.S. embassy. Uh, but I got there, and when I got there, I realized they have the embassy because they're shooting out from the inside the embassy, shooting out at people who are a few people who are out on the street, me being one of them. I made love to a big tree there. Uh, and uh, that, 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 that went on for a, a, a while, a couple hours, and uh, I finally, they finally retook the embassy, and I went in, and I went to the consul guy, and I said, you know, you told me to be here. I'm here <laughs> for my flight. He says, you crazy? He says, go back to your hotel. I said, I can't go back to the hotel. It's in Shalom. Oh, my God. <clears throat> he says, well, go to Tudor Street and find a, a nice hotel. I had nice hotels on Tudor Street. So I said, oh, my God, I'm going first class. So I said, well, I have no money. He gave me a chit just to get rid of me, really. Yeah. So he gives me this chit, and uh, I'm going out, and there's two guys, civilians. And, uh, and they're coming out, and I said, are you guys going by the palace, which was the Continental Palace Hotel, right in the center, uh, across from the Parliament House, in, which is now an opera house in, in Saigon? Uh, so they said, yeah, we're going to Palace. I said, can I get a lift? Yeah, sure, jump in. So I, I jumped in their Jeep, and the guy says to the other guy, says, go get us some sidearms. Do you have anything with you? No, get him one too. So he went back in, got three sidearms. They get, I didn't want to explain to the guy, so I took the sidearm. I sat in the back of the Jeep, and they went whizzing down the street. Now, I understand there was no traffic at all on the streets of Saigon that morning. Now it's about 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock maybe. It wasn't as late as 10. Maybe 9 o'clock. And we're whizzing down the street, and he, whoosh, he kept going right by Tudor Street. And the palace was back there. So oh. I, I, I thought you were going to the palace. He says, we are. He meant the presidential palace. Oh, no. He made a right and then a left. And the next thing I'm looking at is the presidential palace. And I look in front of me, and there's a jeep about a half a block away, three quarters of a block away, get hit with a rocket, blows up in the air. These two guys jump out the side of the jeep, and I'm going down this, the middle of the street in the back of a jeep. I jump out, and I spent all that morning into the early evening, that whole day, 
hide on the street behind trees, walls, while there was a firefight going on between the good guys and the bad guys inside the palace, outside the palace. And then that night I spent it in, a, in, a, in a, an apartment house, two-story, three-story apartment house, underneath the stairs like we used to hide in the old neighborhood. And I got in underneath the stairs. By this time I'd seen numerous people get killed. And uh, I was in shock, I guess. I had to have been in shock. Actually, at one time I thought I had died and being a good Irish Catholic boy from uh, New York, uh, I thought I was must be in purgatory, uh, and I, I stayed under. No, you were You were in hell. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's close to it, but you know, there's still hope. So I spent the night there, and that and underneath the stairs. And the next morning, I, I went outside, and uh, and I started working my way back to the waterfront. I uh, ran into the. Uh, to the uh, a, a seaman that I knew who was coming from his girlfriend's house or something. <coughs> I still had the chit in my hand, and I went back to Tudor Street, the chit for the hotel, yeah. and there was a cop standing there, and, and uh, standing outside of a small hotel. So I said, listen, I'm a da, 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 da. he asked me what I was doing there. Yeah. So I told him a brief story, and uh, he sa I said, w I got to find a hotel. It was my father's hotel right there. He was watching his father's hotel. That's what he was doing. Oh, wow. So I went in. He introduced me to his father. I got a room. And uh, so I bunkered in. Jeez. And uh, so I wound up a few weeks there. Oh, wow. And I still had uh, Pappas to see. So I hung out in a Caravel Hotel where most of the reporters hung out. It was a block from the Brinks. And there was a bar up on the roof. So it was kind of safe. So that's where I hung out, and uh, there was no food in Saigon at the time. And my friend Joe, who I was out with on New Year's Eve, uh, uh, he was on the SS Lehman, which was a United Fruit ship, a refrigerator ship. They were loaded with food. Wow. So every day I would go down to see Joe, and they would feed me and take up a collection the first time that they did at least. Gave me like a hundred bucks from the crew. It was a good union ship. I was a union man. And, uh, and every day I'd go there, pick up food, bring it back to the Caravelle Hotel, so obviously I drank for free. Yeah. So as long as I was there, as long as I was bringing back food, I was a popular guy. So uh, while I was there, I uh, had one more guy to find. That was Bobby Pappas, and he was in Longbin. <clears throat> so I, I located where Long, Longbin was from the, the crowd yeah. at the Caravelle, and some guy promised to take me up there in a convoy, so I went up there. I found Bobby Pappas. It was great fun. We, in fact, he was in the middle of a bunker, this huge bunker. Uh, I, I mean, a, a ammo dump. Wow. And uh, so I spent a few days with Bobby, and we had a great time. And uh, me coming from Saigon and having been there at the battle of, yeah. uh, for the embassy, they were asking me like I was some kind of expert. By the way, everybody along the way saw me as a civilian, so I had to be some kind of government agent. Yeah. What agency? Yeah. That, and the and when I told head, them yeah. the truth, they didn't believe me anyway. So I stopped telling them. Yeah, I just, you know, believe whatever you want to believe. I was just funny. trying to stay alive. Who the heck would mm -hmm. believe it? Well, That's amazing. Pappas believed it. How long was the whole trip? Well, I, I left uh, Inwood in, in November. I got to uh, Vietnam in uh, the beginning of January. Uh, and I finally got out of Vietnam the end of maybe the middle of April, just be, as baseball season started or something. Uh, it was after St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and uh, w when I finally got a job, and I would have, st I'd still be there. Which is, which is the high holy day for Irishmen. Yeah, 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 <laughs> the, the, holy, the high holy holiday, yeah, absolutely. So I found Pappas, convinced him that the war was over. All right, and then went back to Saigon after a couple of days with Bobby. I'm back up the, up on the roof of the Caravelle Hotel, and the whole sky lit up north of uh, Saigon. And I'm looking, and somebody said, "Oh my God, that's got to be the ammo dump at Long Bin." And he didn't know about my friend Pappas there. And I had just left Bobby in the middle of it in this little bunker in the middle. He was the communication guy, he was a sergeant at the time. I said, oh, my God, he's got to be dead. So the next morning, I got another guy to give me a, a, a ride up to, up to Longbin. I got there. The place was blown apart. 
Uh, but they remembered me from the previous days yeah. with Bobby, so they brought me to the to this bunker, and I went in there. I'll never forget with Bobby. He looks at me and he says, "Oh my God, you!" He says, "You convinced everybody here the war was over. Does this place look like the war? There's shells laying all over. Oh, it was God. a mess." So I, he's, he was calling me names, and I looked at him. I said, well, well, he's not dead, obviously. As a matter of fact, he's very healthy and very normal. Cause and he's very angry. And very angry. But it was beautiful. Of course, I'm laughing at him because I thought I was going up there to get his body, honestly. Oh, really? I thought he was wow. gone. So uh, I went back to Saigon. A couple of days later, they, uh, I got a, a, one of the ships, the Lehman, the same ship Joe was on, uh, was hit with uh, fire. And an oiler was wounded, and they took him ashore to the hospital, and uh, he was not going to come back. So, uh, g again, that good union man had that, uh, the captain uh, uh, hire a replacement for the guy who was wounded. And I got the ship, and he says, well, go back to your hotel and get your gear. I said, I'm not leaving. I stayed right yeah. on the ship because I'm not going to miss this one. Yeah. So uh, I got off the ship, I don't know, 30 days later in, uh, in Seattle. Got paid off in cash, uh, flew right to New York, got off the plane. I had a few cocktails on the plane. Uh, they put me in first class. It was clear that where I was coming from. And uh, the cab took me back up to the old neighborhood. I got out of the cab, walked into the bar, and Lynch happened to be standing there. And he was the guy who started this whole thing, the colonel. <laughs> Did you? No, 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 I wasn't going to hit nobody. I was a very peaceful man by this time. I would, no more wars. No more wars for Chicky. Yeah, I hear you. So he, he shouted out, I'll never forget it, it's Chicky, and he's alive. <laughs> anyway, so that's my story, and that I'm sticking to it. That is an absolutely amazing story. Uh, now, you recently went back. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, again, uh, uh, my trip was really a mission. To do what they to said. Bring beer to the guys very, who, who, very <laughs> simple to let them guys know that we supported them. There was hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating at the time. So this was my way and the neighborhood's way of saying we support you. We're with you. Yeah. So uh, when I left there, I uh, spoke to the Lord, told him, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much for bringing me home. I said, uh, somewhere along the line, I said, if I'm alive 50 years from now, I'm going to go back, pay my respects to those guys who were all killed there, particularly those guys who were killed that day. The guys so who died really from the you really to visit some of the cemeteries? No, they don't have any, any American cemeteries. Over there. Really? Not that I know of. Wow. No, they brought all our dead back, unlike World War II, the yeah. ones they could find. Yeah. So uh, I went there, and I went to the spot where I saw a, a couple of GIs killed. And I went to the spot where that house was that I took refuge and where that Jeep blew Was that house still there? The house was there. It was finished. It was under construction where wow. they were firing, not the one I was hiding under. That was later on in the yeah. day. Uh, but the house was finished. The, the, uh, the, cap the palace was still there. And I should have realized that they won. So they'd be having a celebration. I was going there for a memory and to say a prayer. And I'm outside that palace, and there are tens of thousands of them there. And they're all proudly wearing their uniforms and their medals, <clears throat> which they have every right to and should, I guess. Uh, and, but it was just unusual. Uh, they still wouldn't let me in the embassy. Wow. It was a consul now. As a matter of fact, they, uh, they told me I couldn't stand there, even outside the gate where the battle took place. And uh, I, 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 did, I knew what I had to do. Yep. So my wife stood across the street and took pictures. Yep. And, I, and I blessed myself and started praying. Were you married at the time of the trip? No. So no, you're no. still single. So Honestly, you didn't have a wife to hit you over the head with a frying pan. I got married Say, right after. What are you doing, Chicky? <laughs> Within a couple of months after coming home, I got oh, married. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah I yeah, could yeah. imagine. It was time to settle down. Wow. Chicky, looking back, was it a good thing? My trip? Yeah. Well, yes, in the sense that uh, uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind I did the right thing. Uh, somebody had to do it. 
yeah. I had the opportunity to do it and the wherewithal to do it, so I did it. And and very you, few people could. And you brought some life into a dead situation, a frightening situation. That Vietnam was a tough thing to live through. And for you to go there just to help give some good moments to some people who needed them, it's pretty incredible. There's a, a videotape on, on the YouTube uh, called uh, The Greatest Beer Run Ever was put on by Paps Blue Ribbon, and it was after 47 years we have a, had a reunion. Those four guys, three of them, and <clears throat> one of the guys said it, two guys said the way I, 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 I was on it to hear them. Rick Dugan said, well, you know, they said, well, how do you feel about this? Said, well, you know, well, wow, maybe, maybe there are some people back there that still care about us. Yeah. All right? And that, that's and, the and, 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 and wow, I, it, still, yeah. it still gets me when I repeat that. And Collins said, you know, it, it, it was great to see a guy put himself in harm's way to come over here to pat us on the back. And, and that's, that was my mission. Yep. And that that's was all my I mission. I want to hear you say, because we're, we're in like the last minute of the show. The mission was to help those boys realize they were not forgotten. Absolutely. And that somebody really cared back home, and you brought the message from back home to them on the battlefield. Yeah. Amazing. Any last words? Well, uh, all four of them guys are alive 50 years later. Wow. We get together often now, and we speak, uh, oh, every few weeks. Uh, no more than if a month goes by without me speaking to them. That's great. And some of them have gone for help uh, after all these years' treatment to, yep. to, to the VA. And, yep. and uh, I, I'm, am I glad I did it? Absolutely. Yeah. And even, Absolutely. I mean, in, in every sense, you're a vet just for that trip. <laughs> because you went through a lot of the things that these guys went through. Well. So, Chicky, on behalf of those four guys and all of the guys in the armed forces, thank you for stepping in harm's way and for realizing that we're not alone in this world. Is this the time I plug my book? Yep. Hold it up. And the greatest beer run ever. I'm going to hold it up myself. The greatest beer run ever. It's an incredible book. It's an incredible story. You are an incredible man. I can't thank you all enough for joining us today. The greatest beer run ever. The greatest guy thank I know. Thank you. Thank you. Chicky, again, thank, thank you, you for being who you are. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs>